good pictures are the best lessons you can get. My God! When I think of the few things I hugged to my heart and branded on my brain in those dark days when I was struggling with appalling ignorance. Two pictures, a Fortuny and a Boldini, at an exhibition, opened my eyes. From a letter to a friend who was about to enter an art school, Robert Bloom wrote. Robert Frederick Bloom was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, in 1857. He was a naturally gifted artist and for a time was employed in a lithographic shop. Although he was learning a trade, his goal was to paint. He began study at the McMicken Art School of Design in Cincinnati and ultimately left to study in Philadelphia at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. It was, however, in his home city that he finds, I saw probably three times the publication of Gazette des Beaux-Arts in which cartoons of Baudry's work were reproduced, and which I was too timid to go to see more often than once in two weeks is all I can remember of cheering and helping me in that dreadful period of my life. They spoke to me in a way that other canvases failed, and without knowing it then I now realise that it was because they lacked that certain conventionality of picture-making so apparent in all pictures. No, sir. I can't help thinking that there is a great deal of nonsense in art schools. You are bound to come finally to the point of finding out things for yourself. He came to New York City in 1879, and his original talent was warmly encouraged by Alexander W. Drake, in those days the art editor of Scribner's magazine. By 1880 he was enabled to make the first of many annual European tours, and he reveled in the beauties of Venice, Madrid, Toledo, and Seville. Two years later the Society of Painters in Pastel, of which Blum became president, showed the first works in his favourite medium. He ultimately went to Holland in 1889, and in the same year his masterpiece, The Venetian Lace Makers, a painting now owned by the Cincinnati Museum, was exhibited at the Exposition Universelle and was awarded a medal. The great dream of his life was realized on June 6, 1890, when he landed in Japan to carry out a commission to illustrate Sir Edwin Arnold's Japonica. In 1891, Edwin Arnold, the English author, won fame for his blank verse epic, The Light of Asia. Blank verse is a poetic form, usually an unrhymed iambic pentameter. Many poets utilize this verse form because it's like normal speech with a musical effect. The book deals with the life of Buddha, Japan the country, Japanese people, and Japanese ways and thoughts. A collection of articles written by Arnold on his observations of Japan and its people during his year's sojourn, which he describes as being one of unbroken grace, profit, and pleasure. From the very beginning, when Blum's Coney Island drawings were appearing in 1879, something definite and complete was recognised in their quality. His best pencil drawings, delicate, deft, and gem-like in their sharpness, were justly regarded as masterly. Because of his intense admiration for Mario Fortuny's pictures and the effect on his own work, Blum was humorously nicknamed Blumtuni. When his time in Japan drew to a close, Blum felt it had its lasting effect on his art and one can see how he sought Fortuny's influence in producing the pictures, with the added bonus of pastel as the chosen medium, and a touch of his friend James McNeil Whistler in the etchings he produced. Blum, however, was no slavish imitator. The virtuosity, freshness, and lively charm of the artists he admired showed the young American what he was after, and he wisely accepted their accomplishment and tried to go further. Blum concluded in his letters to friends, Originality was to come from within, and though Japan never taught him her greatest lessons, she nevertheless gave him an opportunity to find himself in his pastels. That the Japanese who saw Blum at work had experienced virtually the same original sensation. The artist tells about it in a long and intensely interesting letter to his friend Jules Turkas, where he describes a day of his routine life in the little house on. Being in possession of Pleasure Street in Tokyo, Crowds used to collect while Bloom made pastels in the open air. After a long survey of both me and the work, he wrote, I will hear them say, my, or oh my. It puzzled me at first, till Miak told me it was a term they use in admiration of a poem, picture, etc., and meant literally, good enough to eat. It is extraordinary that the note of joy should predominate in the work and life of a man who suffered such acute physical pain. His compositions are musical and rhythmical in feeling but the thrill of his smaller things is absent. This is in regard to the undertaking of his mural work. 
His taste was perhaps too delicate and reserved for work on such a colossal scale. Their importance in the history of American mural decoration can certainly not be overestimated. These great canvases display the patience, character and talent of the man and much of his genius. He had studied his problem carefully, and his solution was eminently successful in many ways. In far-off Japan he would sit alone before his kerosene stove with Mary his cat on his lap and talk to her, about distant loved ones, and especially about Alf, the dear good fellow, who was always doing things that go right plumb to the bottom of a fellow's heart. In his charming letters to a host of friends we come most closely into touch with his rarely beautiful traits of character. He seems to have been a consistent idealist with nothing mean in his make-up. When clever caricatures embellish the letters, you know instinctively that they are humorous little sketches, inspired merely by a genial, witty nature. Friends bound him to his art and to his life, and when the short span allotted to him threatened to snap, it was the friends he would leave behind that he most thought of. His letters to Otto Bakker and his family were often filled with little character sketches. Robert Frederick Bloom died of pneumonia at his home at 90 Grove Street, New York City, on the 8th of June, 1903. His work has been an inspiration, and the trials and tribulations to find his own voice in painting are a lesson for all who journey in life to reach personal perfection as much as is possible. Consider subscribing for future presentations as we hope to bring you even under-discovered artists and topics on art.